Why do people believe lies? Why is truth so hard to find? And why does science feel under attack from within? Today we are diving into the tension between truth, fiction and the forces that shape our understanding of reality. This is Longevity Now, Longevity Now FL. I'm Luigi Fontana, Professor of Medicine and the Scientific Director of the Charles Perkins Center RPA Clinic of the University of Sydney. Let's start with a fundamental difference between truth and fiction. Truth and fiction. So, number one, truth is complicated because reality is complicated. Understanding Truth requires effort, time, and resources. Truth demands evidence, testing, and constant revision. Yes, contest, contest, con constant revision. Fiction, on the other hand, is easy. <laughs> it doesn't need to be accurate. It just needs to be appealing. People love simple story because they are easy to grasp and emotionally satisfying. Think about stories like conspiracy theories. They offer quick explanation for complex problems while the truth might take years of study to uncover. You know, Plato, the famous philosopher Plato, understood this well. In his book, Georges, he warned that people are more likely to trust a persuasive, attractive speaker than a wise philosopher. As Socrates puts it, rhetoric, the art of persuasion, can make an unqualified speaker more convincing than an expert, simply because people respond more to style than substance, to fiction more than to truth. The same problem, unfortunately, persists today, and even, it is even more amplified by social media. Fiction, especially when delivered by charismatic, handsome, beautiful people, often wins over dry but truthful analysis of facts. Now, here is why pursuing truth is so difficult. You must understand that. Science, which is our best tool for finding truth, thrives on doubt. Yes, on doubt. Every experiment is a test, not just to confirming what we know, but to challenge it. Yes, to challenge it. Unexpected results and contradiction are not failures, they are how we learn. As a scientist, every time I run an experiment, a new experiment, I'm confronted with how vast and complex knowledge truly is. The process is humbling and often leads to discoveries that overturn our assumptions. But here's the problem. Most people don't like uncertainty because they've been educated to believe to simple truth. People gravitate toward simple, absolute answers. They like dom dogmas or oversimplified solution even when the reality is far more complex. This is why it's hard to convince someone who is already entrenched in a belief to accept the subtle, often messy truth. This is exactly why Plato lamented that philosophers who seek truth are often ignored in favor of rhetoricians, the sophists, who tell people what they want to hear. It's more comforting to believe a polished, 
handsome speaker than a careful thinker who admits to complexity and doubt. <laughs> the problem that, unfortunately, even science nowadays is not immune to the pressure of human nature, especially when money, money is involved. And there is a lot of money in science and in the medical sphere. When researchers or health professionals start selling products or services, economic interest can distort their findings, it's obvious. If a scientist profits from a product they are studying, it's easy, consciously or unconsciously, for them to favor results that benefit their work, their products. But this leads to biased research, selective data reporting, and a dangerous cycle where science is no longer, no longer about truth, but about profit. And we see more and more and more of this, unfortunately. This damages public trust in science. This damages, hurts public trust in science. Studies manipulated by financial incentives can still appear legitimate, which misleads the public and undermines genuine progress. The result? People start doubting not just bad science, but all science, creating a dangerous environment where misinformation thrives. And then there is another problem. Beyond direct financial conflicts, corporations, yes, both big and small corporations, pour vast resources, financial resources, into shaping media narratives and public opinion. Well, they achieve this, for example, by hiring journalists, influencers, uh, social media influencers and public intellectuals, as well as through sophisticated advertising campaigns designed to push favorable perspectives. Media outlets, heavily dependent on corporate advertising dollars, often find their editorial choices subtly or overtly influenced by financial interests, affecting which stories get amplified or buried. Affecting which stories get amplified or they are dismissed. Influencers and opinion leaders sometimes unknowingly become conduits for corporate messaging, making it increasingly difficult for the public to distinguish genuine analysis from strategic persuasions. Ultimately, the fight for truth is also a struggle over who controls the platforms and voices that define public discourse. So, what we can do. We often think of markets as being built on informed consumer making rational choices. If that were true, for example, a food advertisement would simply present facts about the product, its ingredients, nutritional values and price. But that's not what advertising does. Instead, advertising is designed to create uninformed consumers who make irrational, yes, irrational choices. Rather than providing useful information, ads rely on emotional, emotional appeal, featuring famous celebrities, singers, athletes, or aspirational Im Im imagery to create a connection that has nothing to do with the product itself. A soda, ice cream, or fast food commercial doesn't list health or safety data. It showcases a beautiful figure 
stylish and exciting lifestyle or an emotionally uplifting moment reinforcing a narrative that bypasses rational decision making. The goal is, isn't to inform, is not to inform, it is to manipulate by creating emotional association rather than providing real data, advertising skews consumer perception, much like misinformation skews public understanding of science and truth. So, how do we fix this? First of all, we should improve media literacy in schools and not only schools. People must recognize how corporate funding influences information and develop critical thinking skills to evaluate sources. Second, and probably most important, we should integrate health literacy into education. Schools should provide knowledge and practical skills on how diet, exercise, sleep and lifestyle choices impact both personal and planetary health. Indeed, despite the wealth of mechanistic knowledge linking nutrition, exercise, sleep, cognitive training, emotional health, these topics receive little or no attention in primary, secondary and university schools and universities, including medical schools. You know, Schools and university should not be a loose collocation of specialized academic silos, but transformative engines that provide not only the expertise needed to have successful careers, but also knowledge and practical skills on the mechanism and intervention linking diet and healthy lifestyle to human and planetary health. Another important point is encouraging public skepticism. We must learn to question findings, especially when they align suspiciously with economic motives. Finally, promoting trans transparency, researchers and not only researchers must disclose conflicts of interest openly and we should restore intellectual honesty. Science must prior prioritize truth over profit, no matter how inconvenient the results may be. The pursuit of truth should never be compromised by external pressures. Science needs to say a beacon of knowledge, not a tool for financial, financial gain. The bottom line? Truth is hard because reality is complex. Fiction is easy because it's simple. Science thrives on complexity and doubt, but is also vulnerable to human flaws like greed and oversimplification. If we want to live in a world guided by truth, we must embrace the messy, difficult process of uncovering it and protect science from the forces that seeks, seek to exploit it. So, we can clearly see deep flaws in our society, institutions and culture that must be addressed through new philosophical and political strategies that go beyond traditional frameworks. Activists like you and me have played a critical role in securing the rights we enjoy today not just by implementing policies informed by data, but also by reshaping our collective understanding of the world. This is a reciprocal process. Action generates learning and learning deepens our understanding, enabling us to refine our approach. Despite the huge obstacles, in a free society, there are immense opportunities for those who seek knowledge, organize effectively and fight for their health and rights. True progress is not driven by isolated grand gestures, but 
by the countless small deeds and thoughts of ordinary people, each one contributing to the significant events that shape history. Let me finish by saying that significantly improving human and environmental health, societal wealth and well-being is possible, but it requires a profound transformation in the way we live, think, al alongside the development of a new environment center, industrial and economic system. Much of the knowledge and technology needed to enact this reshaping of our future already exists. But most importantly, we must recognize that both individual and societal wealth, happiness and well-being are not simply dependent on material, material goods and, and economic growth. They are powered by physical and psychological emotional health, the quality of life, the richness of our social relationship, and most critically, by the health of our environment, our natural capital that sustain all life on, on Earth and must be served for future generations. Thank you for listening. As always, this is uh, Longevity Now, Longevity Now Fell, the channel, the YouTube channel of science and philosophy of health and well-being. I'm Luigi Fontana, professor of medicine, the scientific director of the Charles Perkins Center RPA Clinic of the University of Sydney and a clinical academic in the Department of Endocrinology of the Royal Prince Alfred Hospital in Sydney.